Hello, I'm delighted to host our speaker for tonight, Robin Lane Fox, who is an ancient historian and classicist. Robin began his university education at Magdalen College, Oxford, reading classics, and continued his research at Oxford with various fellowships and was appointed reader of ancient history in 1990. Robin has since retired in 2012 and was appointed Emeritus Fellow of New College, Oxford. Along with his many scholarly feats, Robin is also the gardening correspondent for the Financial Times, one of the longest running in Britain. If that wasn't impressive enough, then I'm sure you'd be impressed by the numerous books on the ancient world written by Robin, titles which include The Classical World, An Epic History of Greece and Rome, Traveling Heroes, Greeks and Their Myths in the Epic Age of Homer, and pagans and Christians in the Mediterranean world from the second century AD to the conversion of Constantine, as well as, of course, his most famous work, Alexander the Great, which gives a detailed historical portrait of the enigmatic conqueror and his many military campaigns. Following the success of his book, Robin was asked to become a historical advisor for the 2004 film adaptation, Alexander, directed by Oliver Stone, which features Colin Farrell as the ancient conqueror. Now, almost 20 years on, we have the privilege of welcoming Robin Lane Fox to give his lecture tonight, Alexander Between Fantasy and History. Before I hand over to Robin, I will just briefly explain how we will run the Q&A session afterwards. Um, so after the lecture, Robin will be able to take some of your questions uh, from the audience. Those watching online can post questions in the form below the video uh, window, and we will read out as many questions uh, as we can later. Those here in person can ask a question in the usual way um, by raising a hand and waiting for a microphone. Um, Robin has also agreed to stay for a short while after the event to sign copies of his book if anyone would like to pick one up uh, from the shop downstairs. Um, without further ado, uh, I hand over to Robin. Thank you. Right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, how am I going to do this? I've got to compress um, 32 years and 10 months into, let's say, 50 minutes, 55 minutes, and I have to compress what is 65 years of the running thread of my life, and I also have to get with photographs. It'll be um, extremely difficult. The theme of the great exhibition here is Alexander, myth and legend. Um, indeed, um, Alexander, um, it seems, if you look uh, slightly incautiously, to have met Amazons, uh, to have met elephants with hooves on their feet, to have had horses who lamented at his deathbed, and even magnificently to have gone as far as Scotland. But where is the real Alexander? Uh, the best picture, probably the copy mosaic we still have. I've spent my life fascinated and remain so by the question. Uh, Alexander in Edinburgh, Alexander in Scotland, and me, in pursuit of him in Central Asia. I'm wearing a hat donated from Pakistan by one of my former pupils. I'm in the middle there of uh, the steps with a very rare plant I can discuss later at my feet. Um, I will take you back, if I may, uh, to spring 332 BC. Alexander had just won a crushing victory, the first, a big one, over the Persian king himself and his army, and a peace offer arrived in the camp. Uh, the king offered him 10,000 talents, the whole of Western Asia, the hand of his daughter in marriage, all put to him by his senior general, Parmenion, who concluded, I would accept if I were you, Alexander. And magnificently, aged 23, Alexander replied, so would I if I were Parmenion. He went on to overthrow the entire Persian Empire, which had existed for more than 200 years. It's as if from the Greek kingdom of Macedon on the far side of Olympus, let's say a modern analogy, um, a valiant army emerged in Latvia, would overthrow the whole of Russia, end up on the Bering Strait, and be heading into Alaska, when finally the Latvians mutinied and returned. What an extraordinary achievement. Um, Alexander conquered out into northwest India to the fifth furthest east river of the Punjab, the River Bees. He went through Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, NB. Um, 
and um, a totally extraordinary change for those who traveled with him, uh, who continued fighting after his death, heartening me, even over the age of 60, amazed contemporaries saw them, the unparalleled shield bearers of Alexander's army, the toughest troops in the history of the world who made a total nonsense of anything like a retirement age, let alone the French retirement age of 62. Yeah. These men were as tough from nowhere as the hardened conquistadors from the savage Estremadura of Spain, from where they saw an entirely new world, as we will see now, uh, with Alexander himself. Alexander is born in July 356. Um, picture of his birth miscaptioned in the exhibition. On the right, that is actually an allusion to the legend that already that the temple at Ephesus started to burn on the night that he was born. I'd just like to add a small correction there. Um, he was... Um, became a myth and a legend, but already it impinged on him in his lifetime and greatly enhanced it. Throughout, never forget, he retains the spell of youth. By the age of 25, he'd conquered most of the Persian Empire, taken Babylon, Egypt, incomparably the richest man in the world. He was extraordinarily handsome, I have no need to show a picture. Uh, but he was careful of his own image, a Hollywood concern for his own presentation. He regulated who should sculpt him, who should paint him, uh, and who would cut gems and coins with his portrait on. And what a portrait. That regulation hairstyle beautifully swept back, eyes far bigger than I've ever seen in reality. In 1977, amazingly, a lifetime portrait appeared, the oldest we have, on what is unquestionably the tomb of King Philip. I can't show you it because it's become so damaged now. You can see when you go to Vergina Ege, where the great Andronikos discovered the picture which has to be the young Alexander who paid for the painting over the tomb of his father's doorway, hunting in a silver laurel wreath not always recognized, on board his great horse Bucephalus, it's too good to be true, appeared in my lifetime, about to spear the wild animals in front of him whilst his father is attacking a lion. It's almost all there. He became king in September 336 after his father Philip lay dead, assassinated at his feet in the theatre. Um, never forget that either. Alexander was heir to a throne as a king where almost every king before him had not died peacefully in bed. They had often been murdered by their own courtiers, aggrieved subjects or surrounding Macedonians. Um, what about his parents? Well, we're there we have a Mother Olympias, who else but Angelina, a princess of Epirus, the third of King Philip's seven wives. And yes, she was famous for uh, her cult of the god Dionysus, hence the snakes. I haven't prepared to show you the picture in which Angie kindly put the snake down my trousers when I wasn't looking. Um, she's said to have sacrificed animals in hundreds of thousands and tens of thousands, whereas normal people sacrificed only tens and hundreds. That's by Aristotle's pupil, who would have had good sources at court. She was certainly, therefore, extremely pious in her relation to the gods, absolutely no concession to her enemies, and conducted a vendetta against Alexander's um, uh, opponents, uh, sorry, the opponents of Alexander's family after Alexander's, lex, uh, Alexander's death. She was never married, of course, uh, to the Persian king. But the most important figure of all is Alexander's father, Philip, the most underestimated figure in all ancient history, possibly in history until recently. Truly the father of what Alexander created, the Hellenistic world. Um, that has become so true. It's he who founded the model army, he who centralized it, trained it, absolutely crucial provided Alexander with the new officers, instituted the royal pages, built up the court society, created a new unified kingdom across all the little sub-kingdoms in Macedon that cut across the old local loyalties. He did so not by insisting on feudal service from his officers, a frequent mistake. Um, he gave them a lands and estates down in the lowlands with no obligation of service. 
He founded cities. The Philippi are the predecessors to the great Alexandrias, of which we'll also talk. It was he who struck the powerful symbols of gold coins for the first time on the Greek mainland. Um, it was he who laid the plan and the spin for invading Asia. Everything given to Alexander. It was he who showed also that any rebellious city who opposes you is simply flattened. At Olynthus, up in the north, you can see the Pompeii of the Greek world, not destroyed by an earthquake, flattened by Alexander. Remember, Alexander in turn flattens the city of Thebes, he flattens the city of Tyre completely. He is doing exactly what his father would have done before. But the single most important discovery is, of course, in the last. Uh, 15 years at Ege, Vagina, near Thessaloniki in northern Greece, completely changing one wing strand of historical interpretation, which saw Philip as uh, the simple monarch or leader, perhaps, a chieftain, not really a king, I've heard it said, um, in a sort of rotating tribal kingship which resembled the early Germans. Heaven help us, how miles from the truth. Philip built and constructed the most enormous palace previously known in Western history. There we are looking out, amazed on my first visit uh, to one wall recently found because there's the scale of it. It's bigger than Buckingham Palace. Um, it's about 10,000 square meters. It'll be open fully to the public uh, in the summer. Alexander grew up in a gigantic royal setting of the royal palace. The old interpretation that it was he who, when he encountered Egypt or the palaces of Babylon, became an oriental despot is spectacularly mistaken. He was a real king. To a people who've been used to a king, he was brought up in kingship, and in the palace you can walk in the very space where so much happened. Um, at the same time, the palace looks down below onto the theater, down just where that metal is over here look straight down onto it with a veranda so the kings could have their royal box if they wanted to and look down on the theater performances below. It's in that theater, among other places, that the great Greek dramas were performed. The Bacchae was written whilst Euripides, 70 years earlier, had been in the kingdom of Macedon. Um, and it was, of course, uh, Alexander, who, like Philip, is a great patron of drama, actors, this is what he loves, and takes uh, Greek plays out, admittedly, sometimes comedy or satire, as far as India, and asks on the way for his march for the texts of Sophocles and Euripides' Greek drama to be sent to him. Alexander had a brain. You can read whole reams of people who disapprove of conquest, disapprove in humanitarian terms of empire, but they miss Alexander. We'll come back to it. Um, indeed, he had a brain, and indeed, Philip encouraged it. Sent for the cleverest man in the world, Aristotle, whose father had been a doctor to the Greek court, a man of limitless intelligence for the natural world, the theory of politics, logic, physics, you name it, was brought to teach Alexander at a site, the major school where they taught, which I believe with Greek archaeologists we have now correctly identified for the first time and will when uh, restrictions ease, begin to excavate. Extremely exciting. Uh, not so far away from the Macedonian court. And Aristotle certainly wrote later texts for Alexander, one on settlements abroad, but he had little idea of the extent of the world. Um, it ended, he told Alexander, the Caucasus, that's the Hindu Kush mountains for us in Afghanistan. Wonderful. What a shot China would have been to Aristotle. Yeah. Um, he used to say that we should always assess at the end of the day, before we go to sleep, what we have done that we meant to do and what we have failed to do. Exactly the same is attributed to Alexander in Plutarch's life, and I think it is one of the lessons that he learned from Alexander in his lifetime. But also, so importantly, secondly, Alexander was introduced in detail to the text of Homer's Iliad. And I've come to realize here that despite modern views to the contrary, Aristotle really did annotate a text of Homer which suggested improved readings, it's intelligent teaching. All of this is missing from so many histories you can buy since 1973. Um, a text of Homer's Iliad, um, very, very important. Um, and I just would like to dwell 
on the importance here of the myth and legend that surround it. I'm going to take it in two ways. First, there is, of course, myth in the sense of political spin. Alexander is a master of it, um, absolute uh, adept at presenting what he's doing in a way for public uh, consumption, the public gloss. But there's a second sense, myth as part of one's own mentality, the world in which you live, to us, mythological. Uh, Achilles and Homer, we know, stand very close to Alexander's self-image, not a spin, but as part of his whole um, understanding and interpretation of the world. I would point to the trip to Troy on landing in Asia Minor, quite opposed to the military needs of the moment. Alexander goes, he runs with his beloved Patroclus uh, to crown uh, the, the, the funeral um, monuments, uh, grave markers of Achilles and Patroclus naked. Um, he takes the shield of Achilles, which comes with him the whole way to India, accompanying him into battle. People knew it. When the Athenians send an ambassador to ask reverently for their prisoners back again, three years later in 331 BC, who do they send? The one and only person attested in Athenian history called Achilles. Alexander agrees this time and lets the prisoners go. And of course, the great legend, um, which is truth and related in, in, in pictures for us, particularly by Raphael and the Vatican, that after the Battle of Issus, the precious, most precious casket of uh, King Darius was captured and brought to Alexander. Many opinions were expressed as to what should be put into it. No, said Alexander, into it I wish to be put the most important, my copy of the Iliad, which I believe to be the Iliad of the casket, the one with Aristotle's notation in the margin. Of course, alas, alas, lost to us um, in the turmoil after Alexander's death. Now, this isn't some stray um, uh, fantasy uh, for public consumption, trying to present yourself as a new Achilles. There have been other figures in modern Greek history who've done so. It's because the world around Alexander, I can't stress this too strongly, has a superficial Homeric atmosphere to it. He lives, like the Homeric heroes, among a formal order of companions. He's a king, kingship based on personal achievement, not supported by simply inherited majesty. The whole tradition, above all, of personal leadership, going first out like the great heroes in the battles of the Iliad, uh, taking life on in battle and hunting face to face. Uh, in the last 15 years, further excellent confirmation from the very heartland of the Macedonian kingdom, not fully realized by people always, that um, in, Alex in uh, Philip's lifetime, the practice both of cremation and of laying the bones wrapped in a purple cloth, we have the example famously from the front of Philip's tomb of the bones of the lady in the front chamber, exactly mirroring the funerary rites particularly one thinks um, of those uh, ascribed to Hector at the end of the Iliad. Not just that, but in, in, in cremation after cremation that has been found in the burial plots, there is a strong Homeric impact on the commemoration of death and the practice of funerals in Macedon itself. Because Homer was alive to him as a result, um, personal heroic leadership like Achilles in the front line, not just in battle, but in his beloved sport of hunting. Face to face, like Philip, with living lions, uh, and took them on um, as if they were uh, enemies facing him and just ran them through. This is something we find hard to imagine. And the whole style of generalship, first out into battle, leading the troops on. Yep. This is the style of an entire generation, shared by the great warriors of Epirus, who distinguished themselves in Alexander's career and shortly afterwards, the Western Kingdom, and by Alexander's successors, particularly King Pyrrhus, uh, the, the real king we know about from Plutarch's life in his own memoirs, who told the world how he led first, he rivaled Achilles, and in one magnificent sweep, he says, he cut an opponent in Italy in half. That's what we are talking about. It's the absolute opposite of the modern style of generalship from an office communicating, if at all, by long-range radio. So, 
Again and again, we see examples of it. How he rescued his tutor wonderfully, I'm so grateful to him, who was kidnapped during the siege of Tyre in the forest, and Alexander simply went off the most powerful man in the world and killed the people who caught him, seized his tutor, and brought him back to safety from the forest. In every single battle, every single battle, during sieges and up rocks and mountains, which you see them, you simply cannot believe, cannot credit that one person could have done it. Alexander was either the first or had to be dissuaded from being the first. And famously, on the town of the Malloy, uh, on the River Indus, it is he who jumps down when anyone sensible would have jumped back and takes on about 200 Indians and eventually is hit by an arrow. That is Alexander's style. And the men absolutely loved it. After his wound, an ordinary soldier came up to him and said, a man's business, Alexander, is to be brave. And he added a line from a poem lost to us by Aeschylus. The man of action is the debtor to suffering and pain. Alexander was so pleased with it that he promoted the man and kept him in his inner circle. Um, at the end, uh, the men would march past him in his deathbed, breaking into the bedroom whilst he tried to uh, signal to them with his eyes. They couldn't bear that they were going to lose the man whom they depended. I would like just to read, if I may, the eyewitness account, so difficult for those who see Alexander only from admirably humane perspective of the, of the modern suburban man. This is what he meant to his men. He had been wounded. But the story had spread in India that he was actually dead. But he came down in a boat and ordered the curtains to be removed from the boat so that he'd be visible to them all. The troops still disbelieved. They said it was only Alexander's corpse which was being brought for burial. But then the ship put into the bank and he held up his hand to the crowd. They raised a shout of joy, stretched their hands to heaven or to Alexander himself. Many even said involuntary tears at this unexpected moment. Some of the shield bearers began to bring him a bed on which to carry him wounded off the ship. But he told them, no, bring me a horse. And when he was seen again, mounted on the horse, royals of applause broke through the entire army. The banks and the nearby woods re-echoed the noise. He then approached his tent and dismounted so that he could be seen to be able to walk too. His men, tens of thousands of them, tried to throng around him, some trying to touch his hands, other his knees, other his clothing. Others just gazed on him from nearby and said a pious word before turning away. Some showered him with ribbons others, including me, with all such flowers as India was bearing at that time of year. That doesn't happen lightly. It had been hard won and is the dominant feature of his life. In battle, above all, Alexander is the lead of cavalry. And of course, second only to Alexander's personal fame is the fame of his magnificent horse, Bucephalus, so-called, branded with an ox head, uh, the most famous horse in legend across the world. Um, brought, yes, to Alexander, unrideable, tamed, we're told, by the young Alexander, when he can only have been, if you date it correctly, 11 years old. Contrary to the scenes in the romance in the exhibition, Bucephalus didn't survive to shed tears at Alexander's death, the other way round, he died in India up near the battle against the great elephants on the river Jhelum, whereupon Alexander ordered a city, wonderful, to be founded in memory of his horse. Um, and what is more, little known monument, probably never seen, a Pakistani had paid with his own fortune to put up a personal imitation Greek shrine made of stone and timber to Bucephalus within five miles of the river Jhelum, which I'm going to see and celebrate with him next week, uh, the great Bucephalus monument, believing that Bucephalus is almost certainly buried underneath. That is pushing it a bit. Um, <laughs> however, memories of Bucephalus survive and appear on the coinage of his successor, indeed, um, Seleucus. 
with uh, Bucephalus being the horned horse, I think he really is, shown on the side of, um, uh, uh, of Seleucus's coinage. So, was Alexander great? Oh no, says Mary Beard, no, no, you know, it's all Roman, you know, it's complete rubbish. I mean, you know, I wasn't into this kind of thing that, you know, I am nowadays. You come around from here and you can see he's little. No, Mary, I'm sorry, he was called great in his lifetime. He weren't looking straight. Um, and you can see why if you see things through Alexander's own life. He was defeated once, yes, but not by troops, only by the weather. Um, what I agree was an absolute disaster on his march home. When a coordinated plan uh, between uh, the navy and the army went wrong, ultimately because the monsoon winds had been miscalculated and detained the fleet and a prepared, I can't go into this, store of supplies from accompanying the march. Yeah. Uh, even there, myth was then applied, but in my secondary sense, myth as a gloss and a spin. Alexander, they said, had been keen to try this dreadful march through Baluchistan and the Makran Desert because not even King Cyrus and Queen Semiramis had succeeded. It wasn't that he didn't know it was difficult. He wanted to do it because of them. Well, that's a bit of gloss, I think, later. It was a catastrophic disaster, but never a defeat. Right. Now, above all, Alexander is close to the gods. One of the most difficult questions that occupied me for much of my thinking life. Certainly, he presents himself as the begotten son of a god. And this goes back, I think, to Olympias, who, by a very skeptical source, is said to have urged Alexander to live up to his fathering, his begetting, when he set off into Asia already. Uh, Olympias had told him, indeed, tales of his divine father. He came to believe that he was possibly, he'd been told, somehow the son of Zeus. This is not unparalleled. Dionysius II, the ruler of Syracuse, called himself publicly the begotten son of Apollo. But it comes to a head in his mind in Egypt, with his debtor and his march far out into the desert, to the oracle on the borders of Egypt and Libya, out at Siwa, where we can unravel some of what happened, and I think make some important inferences. The priest, hearing the man who was now the ruler of Egypt, and therefore in his eyes the pharaoh, son of Amun-Ri, stood forwards to greet Alexander in front of the small press corps uh, on the steps of the temple, and hailed him as son of Zeus. Alexander then went in, put questions to the complicated ritual of the oracle, and never revealed what they had been. But the press corps had heard something. There was something for the nine o'clock news. Here he was, begotten son of Zeus. And when they came out, they said to him, Alexander, Alexander, did you hear that? He said, yeah, you can publicize it if you want. And I think it brought home to Alexander that possibly what his mother had been saying all along was true. Certainly, he then promptly, we can now see, identifies himself as the son of Ammon because amazingly, about 12 years ago in the basement of the Cairo Museum, a young Spanish scholar, Francisco Bosch Pajé, discovered an amazing find, an inscription on the side of a, a, a large stele, largely forgotten there, in Greek, from the Baharia Oasis. This is miles away. It's like sort of much Wenlock in relation to the British Library, but it is directly on Alexander's likely, therefore, root home from the Siwa oasis. It's got no other reason to have it. It can't spell Alexander's name in Greek correctly. There are also all the Egyptian hieroglyphs. I could talk all night about it, but I won't. But it says, Alexander, son of Amen, dedicated this. And it is, I think, a direct record of Alexander's personal visit, and it is uh, a record of the boat which he dedicated to Amon. It calls him son of Amon, a knockout blow. Um, very, very important. So the gods, always remember on Alexander's side, a very, very powerful myth. Almost everybody who achieves in antiquity believes they are some way guided by the gods. But what were the questions that he might have put at Siwa? Oh, we can't know, people say. But I think we can narrow them down as way back Sir William Tarn realized in his extraordinary biography of Alexander, which I think I was too one-sided when I wrote on the subject myself. Um, we only hear once more in Alexander's march about the oracular prescriptions of Amen, And they come at a very significant moment. 
when he's boated down the River Indus in India and come out onto us, the Indian Ocean, which he believes is the outer ocean of the world. Wonderful. No idea of further Africa at that point. So he goes out in a series of staged trips out beyond the river mouth and makes sacrifices in accordance with the oracular prescription of Ahmed. Why does he do it there? Well, I would borrow a point from Sir William. It would be quite normal, I think almost certain, for to go to a Greek oracle, the last one Alexander would meet on the borders of Libya, the priest spoke Greek, the Greeks had a long history of visiting it, to ask which gods and goddesses should I honor during my march. And I would infer, though few have, that what Alexander already asked, to my mind, typically, when he was, before he'd even bothered to win the final battle at Gorgamila, was which gods and goddesses shall I honor when I get to the outer ocean of the world? And Ammon told him, and then a few years later, he does that very thing. Because a contemporary um, Aristobulus tells us, Alexander's aim was to be master of all. I do not believe for one moment the modern inference by hopeful epigraphers of a lacuna in an inscription which they thought might show that even in 331 BC, Alexander was still prepared to think, after burning Persepolis, that he might go back to Macedon. Nonsense. Um, he aimed above all to outdo Philip, and the aim was to take the lot. Why not conquer the whole thing? Just as Aristobulus, his contemporary, knew. The problem is that frequently he's lost. Up on Tajikistan and so forth, he begins to think, because he sees fir trees for the first time again, that he's back on the point where Europe joins Asia. He thought that the Caspian Sea before might be an inland edge of the outer ocean in the north of the world, forgetting anything to do with Russia. He thinks that the river Indus would flow down for a long while and connect up with the river Nile and bring him safely back to Alexandria in Egypt. A compressed world, just like Aristotle, who also hadn't got a clue about basic GCSE geography. It's easier to think you will be king of all Asia if you've compressed it. Now, Philip had already been a master of spin. It's Philip who presented the slogan for the invasion of Asia. He claimed that it was punishing the Persians for their sacrileges in Greece back in the year 150 years before 480, when indeed the Persians had burned and ruined the Athenian Acropolis, and also that it would free the Greeks. It's actually extremely clever. It's a revival, people don't always see it, of the spin of the great Hellenic alliance of the Greeks, later only to become an Athenian empire, in the very first flush of their victories at Salamis and also Plataea over the Persian king after 480 and 479. That's the for public consumption. Alexander even allows to be published letters to the Persian king in which he justifies, after a fashion, the invasion he inherited from his father, which was a straightforward campaign, of course, of conquest. Right from the beginning, he appoints Persian satraps to rule over the land of Asia. Okay, he frees the Greek cities, and he really does. It's hard for people to see this when so many liberations, so-called, have gone wrong again and again in modern history. Yes, the Greek cities on the west coast of Asia Minor were free, but those in Asia on the land were simply to go on paying taxes under satraps to Alexander, who is calling himself already in 332 BC the king of Asia. Uh, so the question then becomes, when people hail him after the big victory at Gorgamila, where will Asia end? He has no idea, of course, of, let's say, what to us, Burma, Indonesia, China, or whatever. It seems quite easy to get to the outer edge of the world. He thought, possibly, at the Caspian Sea, he'd touched on outer ocean in the north. He'd gone up to the northeast and found where Europe and Asia and his extraordinary worldview joined. He then came south down the river Indus, and he found the southern outer ocean there. Um, how obvious then in the later years, though we can never be sure, to continue on, conquer along North Africa, and reach it in the west. This is an enormous ambition, but if you know what you want, and you're young, and you're bold, you sometimes nearly get it. 
Now, beyond the Levant, all across Asia, he was moving in a world that had previously, allegedly, been visited by figures of myth, legend, and divinity. And it's important. It's not that he's inventing them somehow as publicity for the Greeks. He himself believes it. He, he believes that in Egypt, he has seen and been brought the very tree that the visiting hero Perseus um, had uh, identified and had named after him during his legendary visit to us, not to him, real to Alexander, uh, to Egypt before him. He believed, yes, that the uh, petrol fields near Hamadan were likely to have been the very source uh, among the Medes, where Medea, Mede, Medea, um, had derived the poison, which many of you know she used uh, to inflame the terrible Jason. Yes, he even believed, I may get the slide in the wrong order. Yeah, there we are. Um, that there were Amazon queens, and one of them is said by the troops, probably not Alexander, to have come to his tent and had nearly two weeks of passionate sex with him in the tent. Obviously some local ruler from the Caspian Sea. We don't know that she got pregnant as a result. But who was to say it wasn't an Amazon unless you'd actually been in her arms? People were prepared to believe it. They were prepared to suggest when they heard that the Hindu Kush was the peak over which the eagle can never fly, that the, that, that was the Caucasus, where the Greek myth said that Prometheus was um, uh, left having his liver devoured by an eagle. Uh, they never actually found the place. In India, they believed um, that Heracles had been before them from identifications much discussed with Indian stories and their approximate similarity. Uh, he was quite convinced that Dionysus had been before him up in Tajikistan where he saw that ivy suddenly was growing again, ivy plants, and also particularly on the borders of Afghanistan and the Swat Valley. And then uh, Indians, very quick to understand what he wanted, present themselves as people of Dionysus, a small group in India, come to him, and Alexander favours them, and they say, would you like to come and see? And they take him up into a valley full of ivy. And we are told, I love to think it true, that the Macedonians were so overpowered that they ran down the hills reciting the chorus of Euripides' Bacchae, which they will have known by heart. Itty Bacchae, itty Bacchae, in the middle of India. That's it. He's in a land of wonders. Uh, of course, snakes, ever more elephants, all sorts of things never ever seen by people before. And naturally, the figures of myth have been there before. And they are indeed the ancestors of the people he is seeing. In an amazing venture in 330 BC, two of his Thessalian officers head off west. Alexander's heard, I think, of mines inland, right inland in Armenia, and they could persuade themselves from words they hear locally, Yazana, which sounds like Yasin, uh, and the clothes of the, uh, of the people, Armenian people, that by God, they must be Thessalians like themselves. They are, of course, the grandchildren of Jason, who had apparently a son called Thessalus, who had, we didn't know it, another son called Armenos, and the Armenians are our kin. I emphasize this. This is not used as some kind of uh, deliberate imperialist subjection. Persistently, since Homer, the Greeks have this way of integrating others into the Greek family of peoples. And in Alexander's case, I could show it again and again. Now, as Alexander marched on, decisively for subsequent history, but not the first, he receives divine honors. I'd like to spend a moment on this. Correctly, he receives honors equal to those paid to the gods. It is absolutely untrue that he demanded them or imposed them. Never. Least of all on a circle of his inner courtiers. It's completely untrue, though some have tried to argue it, that from 329 onwards he begins to develop the typology of a despot who's gone off his head in some way and is forcing his courtiers to worship him. This is absolutely untrue. It is untrue, too, that from 325 onwards he imposed a gratuitous Stalinist reign of terror, exterminating innocent members of his own entourage. What we do know now more clearly than before, particularly from evidence found and understood epigraphically on, for instance, Thassos, that Philip, too, had had divine honors paid to him in his lifetime. And indeed, Alexander is presented. Here we are on the famous porous medallions. Here is Alexander on one side, totally human. 
on the great Bucephalus charging. There you have him, uh, King Porus on his elephant. This wonderful big silver coin, I believe, actually was struck at Susa in Alexander's lifetime. Some people think just after his death. On the other side, you have Alexander holding a thunderbolt, symbol of Zeus, and being crowned by, uh, by victory. Pretty strong association with the gods. Um, faced with this, extraordinary theories have been produced, none of them making any particular sense. These are issued as valuable commemorative medals of a great achievement to his troops, showing him and his closeness to the gods. One of Alexander's legacy is that once divine honors were given freely, either flattery out of hope for more favors, or genuine admiration for his achievement, or both, they have to be part of the currency of coping with rulers in the uh, world after him, the ancient world. His successors all receive divine honors. Uh, indeed, their, their queens begin to, and so on. Hadrian, even unlike Alexander, deifies his dead boyfriend, Antinous. And that is how ruler cuts spread. It is Alexander who made such offers credible, and then you couldn't do less for lesser people what once you have done for Alexander. So what then are we to try to make of him? Now, of course, the questions that we put to the past keep changing as our attitudes and questions around us change too. Alexander did publish what I would call a rather sexed up dossier to explain to the Greeks as to why he was invading Asia. You only see that more clearly in the light of uh, relatively recent events. And of course, there is another trend. How you should write about Alexander? Well, it's the obvious way is to cut him down to size. The sour lemon trick, Alexander the Little. Very popular, there are actually methodological problems in the handling of the evidence. You can smother it in footnotes, you can cite apparent ancient sources, look at them, and think about the underlying use of the various strands of tradition we had. The whole thing begins to crumble. Yes, of course, Alexander drank, we know that. But he wasn't perpetually drunk so that he couldn't function. We're closer to General Grant rather than Yeltsin. Um, was he then just a sort of just a hooligan? Absolutely no question that Alexander, in an appalling moment, fearing a conspiracy, but nonetheless, grabbed a spear and ran through his father's senior officer, Clytus, right up in um, uh, Samarkand. Indeed, in a palace where the very room where it happened can probably now still be visited. The murder of Clytus is, of course, a constant black stain and was to Alexander. Uh, in a world where the weapons were too freely to hand, where drinking had gone on, and Alexander was initially furious and also terrified that his inner officers were about to turn on him. But nonetheless, murder it certainly was. So should we class him as yet another terrible proof in the past of that entity called toxic, toxic masculinity? Well, certainly masculine, um, but you have to admit, clearer than ever, that Alexander is certainly non-binary. Um, he has an affair, surely passionate, though we only hear of Hephaestion being called his lover in a late version of Arian's, history, uh, Arian's lectures. Um, he was Patroclus to Alexander's Achilles. I'm sure they had sex together. You know, it's not the be-all and end-all. And he plainly, greatly favored the Persian eunuch, Bagoas, who I believe has been rather missed. He is the one Persian made an admiral in Alexander's fleet when it's turned to sail back home again down the Indus. All the others are high-class Macedonians. But there's one figure, Bagoas. He didn't made his, gave his horse a city, and he made his eunuch an admiral in a sailor suit. Think of it. <laughs> um, Yes, <laughs> that now looks different. Non-binary, well, good old Alexander. In the past, horrible, Sir William Tarn couldn't, con con uh, couldn't contemplate it. No, no, he only loved, ever loved one woman and his mother. No. <laughs> We've still got the problem of, uh, of Cleophis out in India. We don't hear enough about her. Imperialist, yes, absolutely, he was. But so was the Persian Empire. I see a strange thing where the Persian Empire is somehow idealized and allowed to get away with any amount of a appalling behavior, exploitation. There's a letter from a Persian satrap saying, I hear there's a revolt in Egypt. Please collect some Egyptians for me and brand them and send them over. <laughs> Thank you. The Persian Empire, Alexander's empire was to be considered rotten, was rotten to the core. And I also think that quite a large part of the population loathed it. I can't pursue that here. Um, and what about India? 
yes, Alexander killed a lot of Indians. And yes, we think, oh my God, sometimes they would have killed him if he hadn't. Uh, he provoked war by being in India, but also India is not a peaceful paradise when he enters. Uh, the Indian uh, uh, rulers are already at war fighting one another, and seeing Alexander's uh, hugely powerful army coming, they do two things. Many of them join it, one, and two, they try to use it and govern their attitude to Alexander by his attitude to other Indian rulers. It's not straightforward. Colonialist, yes, absolutely. And I think not just in the eyes of modern historians, including one who wrote on 1973, but in Alexander's own mind. He felt that he was doing something to liven up, if broadest sense, or to wake up whole parts of the East where no city had been founded for more than 20, 250 years before he came. I'll come back to this. Um, unashamedly so, yes, a conqueror. Yes, imperialist, we can call him. Yes, colonialist. That's the way it was. Was he loath for that in antiquity? Not in his lifetime, though there will always be varied views of an individual. Yeah. Was he somebody who uh, really just was a general and nothing more? I'd like to borrow a remark from a shrewd uh, connoisseur of Alexander, one Oliver Stone, who said to me in our early conversations, what are they thinking, Robin? Do they think he stopped thinking off the battlefield? Good comment. No, of course not. He'd been educated by, Alex by Aristotle. He was an intelligent man. Give him credit for it. Don't try to whittle every sign of it down just because you want to re reduce him to a, a heap of smoking, smoking ruins. Oh, well, he was just a plunderer. He was a bandit. All of these things occur in later philosophers, Christians, and even in Frank Holt of Texas, who argues that all Alexander wanted to do was to loot Asia. Well, steady on a moment, um, Holt and others, he founded cities all across it, not just military colonies, but city foundations. Only the crusty PM Fraser set the bar so high that he could persuade himself and nobody else that Alexander perhaps founded only six. The truth is probably 16. They include Alexandria in Egypt, his greatest legacy. Why did he do that? Huh? Prosperity, trade, fame, much else. Uh, Herat, Kandahar, and elsewhere right on as far as Kogend and right down the river Indus. And he includes non-Greeks, whatever their status was, inside the city. It's not the case that they were just filled with people who were enslaved members of the surrounding population. The one case when there had been a revolt, no more. He found cities, we are told by his, uh, or settlements, to tame um, some of the nomads who've been troublesome and fighting uh, on the approach to Persepolis in order that they should have something of their own and should live henceforward without fighting. He has a sharp eye for assets. Mines, minerals come with him. The Indians have been rather simple about what they own, one of them says. At the coast of the Persian Gulf, Alexander sees that if you settled many more cities along it, it would be enlivened. This is his way of thinking. And also, a result of his uh, march, which we appreciate far more, the big advances, apart from some of the inscriptions, finds, and uh, occasional discoveries in Vergina, has been in coinage. It's Alexander who spreads small bronze coinage across a whole world of Asia, gold, silver in quantities that had never been seen. Uh, the Persian kings, other than the gold, um, Darics, had used uh, um, um, uh, Athenian silver coins. And what about his general uh, presentation? I would like to borrow a phrase by a book by Guy Rogers, unjustly rather neglected. Um, the kingdom of the best. The strong grounds for accepting this. The skeptical Aristosthenes says of Alexander, he didn't divide the world into barbarians and Greeks, but into good and bad and favored all those who were the best. Zeus, he said, is the father of all men but makes the best particularly his own. What a Homeric view, and in keeping with it, Alexander's behavior. He favors the Persian royal queens and the royal family and guests of chivalry, always present in the so-called toxically masculine Homeric hero or in Alexander himself. Wonderful, but not so well remembered as the great Veronese in exhibition, a Tiepolo superb painting for a, a lawyer who uh, addressed the question of refugees in North Italy, the Villa Cordelina. Here is the Persian queen who's curtsied to the wrong person. He's curtsied to Hephaestion instead of to Alexander. 
who says graciously to her, don't worry, he too is an Alexander. And he takes on the Persian queen, respects them, uh, maintains them, and indeed arranges, we're told, for them to have lessons in Greek. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, or again, uh, marriage above all, lovely manuscript version of it here, uh, the, the harp being played to Roxane, marriage NB. And we're told Erastes, he fell passionately in last query in love with her. And she was going to be the, uh, uh, the mother of his heir. He didn't send for a Macedonian girl. Mixed marriages, again, attempts to chip this away have been a disastrous flop, though people love uh, repeating them. Intermarried 92 of his officers on one day with a selected list of Persian princesses in the Iranian style and gave presents to 10,000 of his officers to mark the occasion who had taken on in some way Asian women. It's a mixed population. This is what Alexander is presiding over. They must learn Greek, speak Greek, but it's a, a, a meritocracy in our terms, a kingdom of the best at the center. And then um, it's to be a single kingdom Obviously, to us, an impossible one. It was bound to split, we think. That's because Alexander died, age 32. We couldn't have known that was going to happen. It wasn't his fault he didn't yet have an heir. Roxani was pregnant when he died. He wished to be master of all. And for him, that represented, I think, uh, the Straits of Gibraltar in the west, and if only he'd got there, the eastern edge of the world in the east. Um, I would emphasize Alexander's last plans, which have caused enormous amount of evasion and plain misrepresentation uh, by people who wish somehow to flush this all away. One of the last plans read out after Alexander's death, all of which may have been touched up to be sure that the troops would reject them, was that he would bring the continents of Europe and Asia into close contacts and harmony by exchange of persons and populations and acts of intermarriage and kinship. Well, I don't think this was Alexander's plan, but I think I'd take a modern analogy. That would not be a plausible last plan for, shall we say, Liz Truss. But somebody hostile might allege it had been the plan of Angela Merkel. This was Alexander's view, a mixed kingdom, um, where the old ranks of Aristotle told him to treat the barbarians like plants and animals. No, treat them as equals. And they were. They were right in the inner units. This is so important, the inner court ranks. He didn't have to do this. The Arabs didn't do it to the Persians later. They just kept the Persians in separate military units and clustered themselves in inner tribal units in the army. Alexander is acting here with a vision. Yeah. Try to think and see things through his eyes, too. Of course, we don't like people being killed. Of course, we are against invasions and conquest. But many in a time in his world were not. There is no complaint in antiquity from contemporaries about killing Indians. There will be many different judgments at any one time of a figure as powerful as Alexander. Try to do them all justice. He's loathed, of course, by Democrats in Athens, and he's loathed, of course, by modern nationalists. There is no nationalism in Alexander's world. Um, there are no modern nations in that way. Be careful. It's only a myth, by the way, that Alexander was met by the high went to meet the high priest of the Jews. And hang on to certain points about him. He's generous, supremely brave. He led by example. He would desperately uh, um, uh, ruthless to anyone who opposed him. A city, people, that was it. If you didn't come over to him, he flattened you, just like Philip. He was also a master of political spin. Uh, and the whole of his career is a projection, I think, of the underlying mentality of the gods, the heroes, the legend. The Alexander romance begins with Alexander. Yeah. We might prefer to see his career as driven by the wish to put his father Philip's fame into the shade. Philip and he had had the great falling out. I don't think in any way that it's Alexander who was responsible for the random, terrible public murder of Philip at his feet in front of the entire Greek delegates who'd come to celebrate a wedding at Vergina. We can stand in the very place now in the theater. He lived in a world of the gods and of the heroes and the Homeric heroes. I ended my book as I still would, with the immortal quotes 
of, um, uh, of, of Sarpedon to Glaucus, the great speech, um, uh, uh, Glaucus, sorry, as to why, uh, the Lycians, as to why we should fight. If you and I, one here he says to the other, could be ageless and immortal, never age and never die, I wouldn't go with you and send you into the battle that brings glory to men. But as it is, the fates of death stand round us in the ten thousands, as they still do. So let us go. And Alexander went on terms that nobody has ever gone since. And of course, there were losses. Alexander knew them. If he looked, and of course he had, further in Homer, his beloved Achilles ends in a scene of transcendental power by telling the visiting King Priam, on the floor of the halls of Zeus, there are two jars, one of good and one of evil. To men he gives sometimes good, sometimes evil, or he mixes both. Alexander knew that, and it's still inside him of what he has lost. He lost the Eastern Ocean, and he lost, after all, the beloved Patroclus. So I would like to end with one of the very best elements of the Alexander Romance, possibly from contact with Buddhist sources. We are told, when um, uh, Olympias died, she left uh, instructions to Alexander that at her funeral uh, rites, he should hold a party and he should invite everybody who had not known sadness in the world. So wonderful, Alexander sent messengers. He might have done it in real life. One wonders, he never faced it. Um, out through Greece, ordering everyone to come to a magnificent banquet in Macedon, everyone who had not known sadness. And he appeared and he waited and he waited. And nobody came. And then he realized, all of us have known sadness in our lives. That's legend. It's also part, I think, of Alexander too. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Robin, for that wonderful talk. Um, you really brought uh, Alexander's history and legends back to life tonight. Um, we have a short time for some questions, uh, both from the audience here and from online. Um, so if anyone has any questions uh, for Robin, uh, please raise your hand. Yes, um, the lady there, if we've got a microphone. Um, could I just warn you that the thunder of horses uh, and the chatter of pupils over the years have made me slightly deaf, so I know you'll be very uh, favourable. I probably won't even hear you with the microphone. Can you hear me? I can, yes. That's it's, wonderful. It's a miracle. Oh. Thank you for that tour de force. I'm still trying to catch my breath. Um, it's a long while ago, but did I read somewhere, can you confirm that when he died, he was in embalmed in white honey. Ah. And is this just, a, is this true? And was that honey sold uh, on the route back to huh. Egypt? Uh, I'd have to look that up. Certainly <laughs> embalmed. Um, you remember, it is the epigraph, it always will be to my book. He's taken, obviously, eventually uh, to Alexandria, first to Memphis and Alexandria in Egypt. And um, the Egyptians are then faced with the visiting Octavian, shortly to be the uh, founder of the Roman Empire, Augustus. And they say to him, well, Augustus, uh, Octavian, what would you like to see? Would you like to see the Ptolemies? And he said, no, um, I don't want to see corpses. I want to see a king and they had to show him Alexander, who was embalmed, certainly, and still visible under his glass case. Um, whether it was done with honey, I'm so sorry. Uh, we're not told in any primary source, but maybe in legend, and I've forgotten. Thank you, I'll look it up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Alexander Honey, that would be a new... Uh. <laughs> yes, uh, question over there. Yes, thank you. 
Thank you for that. That was wonderful. Um, you talked about history being subject to revision based on current social mores. I was interested, you've studied Alexander for a long time. Has your relationship to Alexander changed over the period? And, and if so, how and in sort of in what way? Yeah, what a wonderful question. Um, I'm going to revise the book, which has had 50 years running. Um, and I can see, as questions have changed around us, uh, many touches I would change. Um, I think I wrote still in uh, a, a more of an imperialist than in post-imperialist way. I think that's important. Um, first of all, new evidence. Uh, there is a lot. Uh, Vergina, Ege, absolutely extraordinary. Alexander uh, Philip's tomb, patronized by Alexander the Palace, everything enormous. Uh, secondly, some of the inscriptions. Thirdly, some of the cuneiform tablets from Babylon, very importantly. Fourthly, a collection of inscribed unbelievable sticks from Bactria uh, describing um, movements of peoples at the very time uh, of Alexander's um, invasion, hardly expected, sites re-identified, coinage in particular, a mass of better understanding of the volume and scale of it. All of this is important evidence. But I would say um, that uh, the question is certainly that I was most beset with in the days of being um, historical consultant, NB, not advisor, to Oliver Stone, were unbelievably um, out, uh, fierce on two topics, sexuality and nationalism. Um, the, uh, there was absolute outrage in vocal corners of one tiny representatives of the I Iranian world that King Daras was not played by an Iranian. <laughs> I didn't dare tell them it was played by an Israeli. <laughs> And I could see what a barrier nationalism makes. I can't emphasize this too strongly. There is proto-nationalism amongst the Jews, but it is not present in antiquity. And you have to really be careful to keep that out. And sexuality, was Alexander gay? What did that mean? You know, like okay, fine. Um, he had sex with various things, a eunuch, several women, uh, and, and, and men. Um, you know, so what? Okay, it's not the most important thing. Um, those would be two examples, but I'd say the, um, the, the, the balance between an imperialist view and what we think of the people on the receiving end is a very important change, and the evidence I've described an important change, and there is a technical thing. There are two strands of information about Alexander. One comes from the officers, and the other is an uncertain origin known collectively as the Vulgate, Diodorus, Curtius, and so on. And at the time I wrote, it was tempting and indeed beginning to be fashionable to pick bits you liked out of the Vulgate and use it to destabilize the officers. I now realize that this is extremely perilous and has been pushed far too far and on a methodical inch by inch examination of it all, we shouldn't do that. Um, people write with very, very strong party pre-positions on Alexander. So do I. And sometimes you can appear to cite sources that actually support you. Look at them. Often they don't, even if they're footnoted. And secondly, if they're vulgate, they're usually rubbish. I'll give you an example. Uh, the great Brian Bosworth, my dear friend, um, a meticulous scholar, um, was very, very uh, 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 in the wake of the anti-Alexander brigade. He became a, a strong anti-Alexander figure for a while. It moderated in later life. And he even argued in his commentary that because the Persian queen, uh, sorry, one of the Persian uh, um, princesses, um, uh, Darius's wife, sorry, died in childbirth. Um, she did not die until 331 BC, and it was Alexander who had fertilized her. This is absolute monumental nonsense. Um, he, the death is put in 331 in sources that get every single thing wrong. But it's suited to pull it out, you see, and then use it to destabilize the view, which is the correct view, that Alexander was chivalrous to women. I could give dozens of examples from that great scholar's work, which makes it fun. There's so much more to play for. The subject's still alive, for God's sake. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, we'll have some from online. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, we do have some online questions for you, Robin, tonight. Uh, we have a good one here from um, Krishna. Oh. And the question is around the lines of whether Philip, had Philip not been assassinated, whether he would have attempted what Alexander did, uh, <laughs> either a diplomatic or a bloody takeover of Persia. Uh, what a fascinating question. Um, well, first of all, Philip would have failed. Um, because he was not the genius that Alexander had to be to win. 
Uh, one measure, I do not believe Philip would have done this. Alexander wins the Battle of Issus in November 333. He continues methodically down the coast of the Levant, uh, waiting for cities to surrender, and if they don't, they're flattened. Tyre's flattened, Gaza's flattened. He goes to Egypt. He comes back to Tyre, and he waits there for months and doesn't move. He is waiting for the Persian king to gather as big an army as he can from the rest of his empire, and only when that em army has been amassed will Alexander march east and knock him out, wham, in a victory. I don't think Philip would have had that boldness. What Alexander did not want to do was to have the experience of Xenophon and others of getting into the middle of um, Asia with the Persian king and half his army still at large, having to besiege Babylon and so on. He wanted the one hammer blow. I think we can't know. What a lovely question, Krishna, that Philip would have contented himself with Western Asia. And what Parmenio and I began with, it, the offer of 10,000 talents, Persian king's uh, daughter, lovely in marriage, and 10,000 talents and half of Western Asia, that would have suited Philip. I don't think we'd have seen Philip in India. Well, thank you so much, Urban. It's a great lecture. Very Alexandrian, I'd say. So my questions, um, how do you address the mystery surrounding the death of Alexander in Babylon? Oh, very or he perhaps uh, oh, murdered? Oh, oh. Uh, fascinating question. Uh, one, it was not any kind of an epidemic. If you read that he um, died from measles or something, I don't know, there's all of his stories, um, that cannot be right. Only one person died, Alexander, number one. Two, I am not alone now in not believing it was anything to do with poison. Repeatedly in history, when a great ruler dies, uh, the Norman kings are an example. Everybody accuses each other of poison as they jostle for position. The reason is that Alexander drank uh, at dinner and then fell fatally ill about 10, 11 days before he died. And there could be no certain slow-acting poison in antiquity. Still, we don't know of any. So if you were going to kill him, you would have given him the most gigantic dose of the most poisonous thing you could. You couldn't have him <laughs> hanging on for fear that he might recover and kill you all. So out to poison, out to an epidemic. Um, could it be a bite from a malarial mosquito? which only affected him, some think so, that is possible, and there are symptoms that could be related uh, to malaria. But then I come to the question of the symptoms. Doctors love to look at the accounts in all the various sources and assume that they are historically exact. They're all tendentious, and some of them are guessing. The idea that Alexander shrieked because he had a pain in his back occurs in a Vulgate source. I've had endless letters from people, doctors, saying, I do have evidence that now leads me to be able to diagnose the cause of Alexander's death. Will you come and meet me uh, for lunch in um, wherever? Um, and it turns out to be that they think you can take at face value and transfer into modern terms the symptoms. But I did have a very interesting um, uh, communication from a serious medical expert in Leiden who has to deal with the victims of binge drinking in uh, Leiden and other uh, uh, Holland uni Dutch universities. And he said there have been tragic cases where young people have drunk much too much and they have developed a fever, very, very interesting, gone on for a fortnight and then died. So it is possible that Alexander, I still don't know whether this is true, on the whole I go for the malarial mosquito, but uncertainly, had been drinking particularly heavily. We don't know that. The officers tried to claim he had to deny the fact that he'd poisoned because he went into a slow decline. And it was actually excessive drink that got him. But I would make the point that the uh, descriptions of the medical symptoms are precise but not necessarily accurate. They cannot be translated into indiscriminate modern terms. It's not poison, it's not an epidemic, might be something malarial, nobody else got it, uh, or it may quite possibly be drinking after having been quite badly wounded in India. So the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> right, I have uh, another question. How would you address the rumors that uh, Alexander's body lies in a Vatican tomb in place uh, of uh, a saint? Uh, uh, is this instant, are you talking about Mark, St. Yes, Mark's? Or? Yes, 
Marks. Yeah. Marks. Uh, yes. Well, this is dear Andrew Chugg in his theory. It, um, you know, I said to him, I thought it was quite likely, therefore, you could argue that um, Angelina Jolly was going to be buried in St. Peter's. Uh, no, absolutely no way. Um, I don't want to get into it now, but um, it's a lovely idea that Alexander was mistaken for the body of Mark, which in 828 AD is taken by two figures to Venice and is put um, in St. Mark's Cathedral. Yeah, come on. You know, what was the body of Mark even by 828? Did Mark ever go to Alexandria? We don't know. But even more importantly, none of the pieces, I don't want to go into it all, stack up in this you know, uh, brilliant theory. He's down there somewhere under the concrete uh, in Alexandria. Don't know where. Um, I've got a fairish idea of the jumping, but deep, deep down. Um, Will we find him? I'm sure one day, one day, um, Zeus will allow us some deep penetrating photography <laughs> technique. I'm not sure that even I, who am possibly immortal, will still be alive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that Thank question. You. We'll move now to the online question. Thank, Thank you. Yeah, we do have another question from uh, Gerard, who's watching. Um, although the Oliver Stone film was uh, nearly three and a half hours long, are there any episodes or characters you really wished he had included in the film? Oh, I mean, where, how, where could we stop? Um, I wonder if anybody here saw um, our screening of The Long Alexander. Uh, well, you must, I'd love to hear from you after The Long, the really long one, when many might have thought that it was going to be a, a, a trudge. I found it, as did the audience I talked to, completely overpowering on the big screen. And as far as ever these things will, it worked. Uh, of course, I wanted to be Callisthenes. I wanted to be Aristotle's pupil, who was a historian. He didn't ride a horse. That was the other problem. And what I discovered, of course, you have to realize, you've only got even three and a half hours. A location is so expensive. Everyone says, oh, why didn't you show the Gordian knot? Oh, God, why didn't you show Egypt? Well, the budget would have been <laughs> 500 million. You'd never have got it back. Um, and um, that wasn't possible. Uh, I would much have liked uh, to have had Callisthenes, the historian who was then put to death. Uh, that would have been spectacular. But always, when I read now, imposed partly on my uh, mind when I pause and I look around, say, the reading room in the Bodleian Library, and I look at them all, wonderful new generation of absolutely brilliant scholars, working out this, that, and the other about Hellenistic warfare, I do think one thing. Maybe, but you've never ever charged a line of war elephants armoured on horseback, and I have. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, we'll have one more from the audience. One more question. Yes, um, I've got a microphone. Here we go. Yep. Uh, one of the things I thought was missing in the exhibition is, is the military tactics of Alexander. Yes. Uh, you, so you, I have already thought uh, what you mentioned, that, that he got a larger army because he had a large, much larger kingdom than the Greek city-states oh. uh, in isolation. Mm. Mm. Did he improve on the Greek method of fighting, do you De think? Uh, definitely. Um, and it's Philip who starts it. Um, it's a balance line. Uh, cavalry trained, highly trained, the great veterans, the over-60s, eventually the terrors of Hellenistic warfare, and then the long Sarissa-bearing phalanx. It's pretty good in Oliver Stone's film. Um, and he uh, uh, pioneers, with Philip's uh, example, the cavalry charge as the great breakthrough. And it's very simple. I'll show you Alexander's tactics. The cavalry are in wedge-shaped formation. And believe you me, I've done it. Not many have. You can follow the man immediately in front of your wedge. You set off at an angle like that, and the line opposite tries to shuffle across to cover itself from being outflanked. And then, focusing on the lead wedge person, you turn inwards, like an old-fashioned outside right football player, Stanley Matthews, on the, uh, on the English soccer pitch, and you turn, wham, straight into the center. And that breaks shock and awe the opposing infantry have already broken by shuffling to try to guard against the cavalry charge. And then up come the long spears of the Sarissas that sweep you away. Absolutely, before Philip, you can find tiny little analogues for that. Nobody's put it together. But Philip plans balanced warfare. And I learned, I think, also uh, confirmed through film service, which was not trivial. We had the Moroccan army and then the whole of the cavalry of the king of Thailand. 
Alexander had a wonderful sense of what I would call spatial geography. He was a brilliant master of the use of space. Look at his battle up on the Hydaspes River. It was transformational compared with what the Greeks had known. Yes. Oh, sorry, uh, other Greek city-states had known. Um, and it is, above all, cavalry victory. Thank you. No syrups. <laughs> Yes, um, another one from online, yeah. Yeah, we do have a couple of more nice ones online, if I may. Um, we have uh, Tanya who says, where would you recommend visiting uh, to get an insight into Alexander and his life and leg legacy? Uh, well, you have to go to, first of all, uh, what a wonderful question. And I'm so sorry to be able to have to say that much of the places I would go, you can't. Um, go straight away uh, this summer to Ege, uh, A-I-G-A-I, -I, Vagina, Thessaloniki, a new museum, Paris, the very theatre, unbelievable. You can stand within two yards of where Philip was murdered. Nobody there. Uh, absolutely incredible. Look out across the view uh, with the palace behind you from which Philip had come down, and you understand the scale of Alexander's youth, that he's a cultivated man from a major kingdom. Even though they drank and fought like cats, they're not some sort of pastoral tribe. Definitely, you have to start there. Uh, that would be one. And then I think I would go to Alexandria, even though it is a modern city, very hard to appreciate, but just stand on the shore and think, Christ, what a brilliant place to choose to make your, your really big city. And then, of course, <laughs> um, you can't, if you're me, I'm not allowed a visa, and I pine for the day when it's possible for all of us to link up again with all the wonderful people in Iran who are, are alas, held down by a very different world, um, which is increasingly losing its grip. You have to see Persepolis. <laughs> Incredible. And then out in uh, the Swat Valley, I'd go to Barry Cot. Amazing, <laughs> completely incredible. Um, if you can get there, can be tricky. Taliban swarming over the nearby mountains, but just go for it. Um, <laughs> that's what I would do. Um, what a lovely prospect. But you could travel the whole length of the place. Oh, it's sad, isn't it, to think in the mid-60s, and you can't now. <laughs> right, well, thank you so much, Robin, for your time and, and for your wonderful talk. Um, we'll finish there now, and um, if anyone wants to buy Robin's book, it's available <laughs> at the gift shop, uh, which is open just downstairs. Um, once again, thank you, Robin. Uh, could I just you. explain? Oh, yeah. That was the model of my cavalry helmet, kindly made by Oliver Stone's team. And when I turned up, holy gods, I had a long lance, no stirrups, and I had to go flat out on my valiant horse, Gladiator with the whole of the Moroccan cavalry behind me, trying to knock me for six. Um, and uh, the stars had short swords and stirrups. So I still got my hat. What a wonderful thing to do. Um, you know, I haven't lived in vain. I know I inhabit a world that many of you would say is a world of slaughter. And it was a world of much else, I promise you. What happened was this. I did marry a Bactrian. I brought her back. She looked remarkably like Rosario Dawson. And we founded a nice little um, uh, homestead in Western Asia, and we gardened. And she was very charitable. There are cases of this in Hellenistic age. She gave away, as Rosario would, her money to girls who couldn't be educated and needed diaries. But she absolutely insisted that I never, ever talked about the old days. But one day, a foot follower came all the way from Los Angeles via India, called Oliver. And we were very pleased to see each other. And we went upstairs, and we talked and talked until dawn. And she never forgave me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Robin. What, what a wonderful uh, end to the talk. Um, yes, thank you again to those who have uh, joined in person and online. Thank you.